my my first note there is is best plan. Um, the the best plan is to never need to use your recovery plan, which we're going to discuss on my next slide. Um, we one one of the things that I've seen recently um, uh, over my entire career is the applications and software and data um, being used, and then the the uh, the consideration for its backup and its restore just seems to get lost in the mix. And, and sometimes it's taken into consideration and backups uh, are configured, but nobody's really monitoring the changes in the environment or the needs of uh, those that actually use the software. So I make a note that you know the, the potential for data loss, um, either in the cloud or on-premise, uh, caused by the system itself or the, or the human error, is very, very prevalent. It's always there. Someone can easily accidentally delete plenty of records or the system could crash. And one of the things I want to, point out here, I, I know that a lot of people here are not in infrastructure, not into software, and, and it's not what you do because you're, you know, you're in accounting or human resources or payroll or wherever you happen to work, but you should be involved in the backup strategy and planning. This should be a, a corporate level consideration and discussion so that the IT division, whether they're internal or external, know the expectation. Um, the users should be providing, that's you guys, should be providing guidance on recovery, acceptable downtime, acceptable data loss, and, and how far back your backup should go, because you know some some uh, legislation requires that you have uh, you know specific audit requirements, so those backups are required. So I know again, you, you a lot of people on this call are not involved in the backend um, environment, but you really should be involved in giving feedback to IT. Um, don't assume that backups are being taken um, that suit your needs, uh, and don't assume that recovery testing has been happening. Um, Going to give a, a real world example, absolute God's honest truth. Yesterday, I got a phone call in the morning right before this was starting, a catastrophic failure at a client's um, environment, uh, and not a GP server, pleased to say, but not so pleased to say that it was a critical issue server. and. And the level of failure was such that we had no easy recovery due to what amounts to bad planning. So the most important task for your IT department, whether it's in-house or external, is the planning and deployment and maintenance and revision of a backup plan. And I know I sound kind of emphatic about it, but I, I, you know, I've been doing this for 30 years and I've seen many a time data loss caused because people make assumptions that are completely wrong. Um, you should design an environment that best aligns with the critical nature of your systems and applications in use. What do I mean by that? Um, you know, a server sitting under Dorothy's desk is sometimes not a good plan. Um, you might want something a bit more, uh, you know, robust. You know, um, I talk here about even in virtual environments, which actually this was the cause of the failure um, at, at this uh, particular client's environment, single host, plenty of virtual machines, failure at the storage system, which means all the systems crash. So again, the environment should be designed to fit what is, you know, suits your world and, and the criticality of the applications that you're using. Um, this can happen in the cloud as well, whether you're in Azure or AWS or, or, or anywhere else, you have the same issue. It's still a virtual machine. And if you're not cautious, you can end up in a situation with a down system. I make a note about using multiple storage systems. Again, just reiterating, this happened less than 48 hours ago. The storage system of a virtual host failed, taking out the virtual machines on that virtual host. So there's an example of you should build your environment and, and, and putting the fund in to have multiple hosts, have multiple storage systems and set up replication to protect you. Um, depending again on, on the criticality, depends on how long you can be down you should perhaps consider having either a warm or a cold standby, have that server, a virtual machine in the most cases in today's IT, have it replicated either offline or online so that they're, you know, it's up to date. So if, if one of the systems goes down, you have the ability to bring the other one online immediately. Um, things such as Hyper-V from Microsoft or Hypervisor or VMware or Zen, there's, there's lots of solutions out there for virtualization that provide you this kind of security. Um, in in SQL Server, again, if you're in Azure or on-premise, you consider high availability or clustering. Um, I'm not going to go into all the details of that, but basically it ensures that your data, if some part of that system goes down, you have an ability to come back online rapidly and, and not run into the issue of, oh, we didn't back up this or we didn't know this share existed or, or whatever it happens to be. Um, 
if you use remote desktop services or web services or web solutions, websites, uh, deploy multiple machines, set up load balancing, again, give yourself that uh, best plan um, to protect yourself from actually ever needing to use the recovery plan. Because again, my very first line, the best plan is to never need to use your recovery plan. Um, as far as backup plans go, I touched on some of those there. Um, first and foremost, document the entire environment. Understand what you have got and routinely update it. That should be part of your backup plan because, you know, environments grow. And again, it could inclu include Azure or AWS or on-premise. Um, it could in include outside vendor cloud services, uh, Batchmaster or, or Paramount or whoever it is. Y you need to have a document that tells a story about how your environment completely connects together. This documentation should be detailed. Um, it should include software versions. Um, I'm going to kind of move down a little bit on my middle column. All configurations should be documented as well. That's one of the things we ran in, into, into with the down server was it took out configurations from outside environments and no one knew who it was talking to or how it was talking to them. Um, and, and this unfortunately wasn't our service. We didn't have a whole lot of, of in, insight to it, but make sure you document that URLs. If it's an outside URL or internal DNS, everything should be documented. Current configuration files that contain that stuff, make sure it's backed up, um, whether it's to a outside cloud service or you know old fashioned DLT or an external hard drive, just have it somewhere. Um, all drives on the server should be backed up. Um, some people don't believe in backing up the operating system, the C drive, but the problem with that is, is when you install software and applications, frequently components of that application end up on the C drive. You can't stop it. It ends up in your system 32 directory, your system directory, your, your syswile 64 directory, program files, wherever it happens to be. If you don't back that up and you have a catastrophic failure, even if you restore your data, you could be missing elements to get you back online in the most efficient way possible. Um, use, <clears throat> excuse me, I apologize. Back up your installers. That includes Dynamics GP, uh, Dynamics GP, any software you use. Make sure you have backups of the installation application of the installation installer. Sorry, whether it you know whether it's downloaded or otherwise. Back up the uh, updates if there are updates to it. Keep those backups. They they have to be present. Again, I'm going to say it again. This is honest God's truth. Part of the problem with the, this restore that we're going through now with a different client is the fact they don't have the original installers, and this server is a decade old, right? So I know I can't hear you guys gasping, but it's a decade old and and that's an issue. I can't go back to specific vendors and say, hey, listen, I need this piece of software that was 10 years ago. Um, so it, it makes sure you've got that stuff available to you. And, and this is a list you should be handing to your IT division and your external uh, uh, providers if you have them. Don't assume that this is what they're doing. Um, as far as SQL goes, because we are technically talking about SQL, SQL Server has some fantastic tools built into it for backing up. You can use those and, and really come together with a, a good data backup solution for that application. Uh, it's not going to help you with anything other than your databases and, and, and that kind of stuff, but it's, it at least gives you your data. And you can either you know, use, like I said, the native, or you can use a backup solution that has a SQL agent. There are literally dozens of them, if not hundreds. Some of them are cloud-based, some of them are on-premise. But either way, have a way to back up those databases. Just don't try doing flat files. Um, and then this is where you, you guys are involved as users. You know, determine how many days, weeks, months, or even years of backups are required to best meet the company's recovery and audit requirements. Um, you know, sometimes I, I've had clients reach out. They need to go back and grab some data from a database. And unfortunately, they're only keeping one day or, or two days, and, and they need something from three weeks ago or such and you know just just know and have a plan for what best needs sorry meets your environment I, I obviously can't tell you what that is but if you have audit requirements for legal reasons again IT may not be aware of that make sure they are make sure they're meeting those requirements because again at the end of the day uh, IT are there to really service your needs you're the user so they're there to provide you what you need um SQL provides solutions for full transaction differential. That's just different kinds of backups. I'm not going to dig too deep into that. But um, depending on how granular your restore has to be or how quick you have to be back online, is going to, or how much data you can lose during a restore dictates on what your strategy is going to be. I generally suggest that there's a full backup at least daily if you can do it. 
uh, if a database is large, that's not practical. That's when you get into using full backups, followed by differentials and transactional. Um, obviously, point in time offers you the best flexibility. If uh, if David decides to accidentally delete 50,000 records at 2.30, uh, it's nice that you can restore to 2.29 as opposed to going back to the prior evening. Um, for your IT or anyone that works in SQL, creating maintenance plans is easy. I'll show you a screenshot here in a second. It's just simply drag and drop. You know, you, you, you drag the backup, you fill in a few boxes, telling it where to put that backup and, you, you know, set a schedule, you're off to races. I will show you that. Um, scheduling, develop a strategy that is, uh, you know, considered around users' activity. It's obviously always best to back up full databases and stuff uh, when there's minimal activity. That's sometimes not practical, but take that into consideration. I often hear from uh, actually from IT, oh, well, we use block level backups. Um, that doesn't always work. You know, it's it's not always practical. You, you have to look at how a database works. And sometimes pulling that one file doesn't actually work because it doesn't align properly with the transaction log or otherwise. So um, whoever's setting up these backups, you know, that again, you'll see in a second when I mention it, they have to test them. Make sure that they've actually done those restores and validated. Have a plan so that you know you're not the IT is not running around all panicked when you know Fred from IT announces yeah the whole or from sorry from accounting announces the whole accounting system's gone and and everyone doesn't know what the plan was or where it is how it's backed up. Have that plan. Um, and I mentioned the backup solutions include cloud-based and on-premise. Um, that's awesome. It's fantastic if you've got the bandwidth. Um, one thing to pay attention to with cloud based is again, you have to test your recovery and true story, which I shared with my boss today. Um, I had a client that was doing cloud based backups and they were issued security keys. Um, those security keys were to ensure that only they could restore those backups or access those backups. Unfortunately, they were ransomware and those keys were compromised uh, as in gone. Um, so the problem was, is this particular client then reached out to the backup solution provider and they were just told, we have no way to read your data. None. And that was cataclysmic. Um, it left this particular client in a bind and there was nothing they could do. So keep that in mind. Um, you can put stuff out in the cloud or even on premise. And if it's keys related, don't don't leave those keys sitting on a server somewhere in a file share where someone can just, you know, nonchalantly take take them out that that creates a huge huge problem recovery plan well as i said <laughs> your best plan is to not need this recovery plan um but it, a backup plan is only confirmed to be valid when it's been tested it you know um you you could relate this to lots of areas in your life you know you 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 have to validate something to make sure it is actually good and working and proper and right and a recovery plan is just like that and that's where the documentation comes into play for your backup strategy and for your environment um, make sure that you have tested restoring not just a database that's easy you you sql management studio right click you know task restore database both there it is um but you have to um, go through this scenario, if you will, where configurations and stuff are gone, and then someone in IT has to put all that stuff back. I know it sounds ridiculous, but again, I have a real world situation right now. Um, it is uh, crucial to know the recovery requirements of the organization. Yeah, that's true. Uh, again, I'm, I'm assuming that most people here are users of the system. That's what you dictate. How, can, how long uh, can you be without a system before it's recovered? OK, and that dictates the planning. How many hosts do we have for the virtual service? How many replicas do we have? Is it hot? Is it cold? Um, just just make sure that IT understand that. And of course, potential data loss that can and does happen. So what is acceptable? And again, in some cases, the law is going to dictate what is acceptable based on your ability to fulfill an audit. So that's 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 you guys should be telling IT. Um, or your that your external company as well, and in some cases that may be us. You know, we, if if we're involved in this, then we should be helping you out as well. Um, recovery steps should be documented. It's no different than do documenting backup steps. You know, it's know what what sits where and what has to be pulled forward, and and you know it, what manual things have to happen. Sometimes manual things have to happen. You have to edit files, create files, and so on and so forth. Um, recovery requirements in Dynamics GP environment can include 
full servers, right? And I said back up the operating system drive. Uh, databases, obviously, you, you heard Marvin mention more than once, you know, some companies have 40 databases. Uh, I've, I've had companies that have had 200 plus databases, shares, applications, connection strings, configuration files. All of these should be documented and mapped up. I already mentioned the installation um, uh, installation files or the installers. This, this should all be, you know, available so that you can recover in the quickest and swiftest time possible. So. With that, um, I'm going to go on. I know it's pretty quick, um, but as far as, <coughs> excuse me, um, alerts and database mail, I mentioned that SQL provides a way to um, alert you of a situation with a backup and always have it tell you that the actual backup occurred. Okay. Um, and this goes with any kind of notification system that's telling you something either did or did not happen. With a backup, you want to know that that backup actually occurred, in this case via an, an alert, because if you have a setup to let you know when a backup fails, and that messenger system that's supposed to let you know it failed can't send you the message because either the service is not running or the account has an invalid password or there's a problem with the SMTP or whatever it happens to be, then you take for granted that that backup succeeded. And that's that's not good because then if you do have an outage and you then go to try and recover your backup, you discover, oh, look, this thing's been failing for the last six months. That's a problem. So always set up your alerts to notify you when a job was completed. And then the second urge to that is don't allow complacency to kick in whereby ah, it's another email from the server, it's another email from this group. Yeah, you have to open it and, and take a look, see what it says. It, it, it may say failed, it may say it didn't fail, but you, you need to know that. Or set up a secondary alert to elevate that should, and you can do this in your outlook. If uh, a message contains the word failed, have it elevate that to you. But at least if you're not getting a message, you know something is definitely wrong. Um, Monitoring server health is crucial to providing proactive and reactive responses. I'm going to show you a screenshot of that in a second. Um, one of the things that I see uh, and have been seeing recently is space running out on SQL servers. And that can happen for a variety of reasons, but we, we want to make sure that we're monitoring the space on those SQL servers on, on whether it's the data drive or log drive or the backup drive to ensure that everything can function po uh, properly. When you run out of space on SQL, specifically the log file, uh, sorry, log drive, um, the log file can't process data. So you, you end up with error messages on the front end of your application, which typically don't indicate the right error, but you know there's something wrong. Best thing to do there is to be monitoring that server and make sure that drive space is adequate. And of course, if you're doing SQL-based backups, make sure those backups are going to a different drive. Don't be backing up to the actual data drive or the log drive. Put them on a separate drive, and that facilitates a couple of things. One, it means if it fills up, SQL doesn't stop working. Um, it does mean that someone should address the situation. Um, but that's, you know, it, it, and uh, I forgot my, sorry, I lost my train of thought, but the uh, you just need it on a different drive. Oh, the other thing with that is if it is on a different drive, and you have a catastrophic failure with the data or log drive or the OS drive, uh, you have those backups, they're current. You can quite literally in moments bring up another server uh, in, in a virtual world and then basically attach that virtual disk to that server and then restore the databases as required nice and quickly because it's not on the same server. If you're backing up your databases and they are on your data drive and your data drive virtual or physical or your RAID controller goes out and everything's on that one that one rate set or that SAN or that network attached storage, you you lose everything. So divide it up. It should be broken down so that you aren't in a position to actually need this recovery solution, which was my very first point. Um, one of the things I see also here frequently have an attention. Um, this sometimes happens, you know, uh, because people just don't know. I see users, you can take backups specifically through Dynamics GP uh, or through SSMS if you have it. I see people taking backups uh, ad hoc, which means just like on the fly, I need a backup, I'm going to do a backup. Um, but then they don't tell anybody or they don't do it with the copy only switch. Um, the copy only switch prevents the full backup 
from clearing the transaction log. OK, um, that does mean that technically your backup isn't 100 percent. But if you if you don't use that switch, you just take backups, then what will happen is you're and, and they're not known. If you end up needing to do a restore and no one knows that you took that, your IT department are going to look at the backups, try to do resource, potentially try to restore transaction logs. And the LSN, which is a number which shows it's a, it's a, it's a sequence number, which connects your transaction logs together, is not going to line up. It's going to be broken because somebody took a backup right in the middle of the process. Right. So um, if you have a, your IT department doing a backup at night and then transaction logs throughout the day, and you take a backup, you know, at two o'clock in the afternoon. Well, if you have a catastrophic issue and your IT division restore the backup from last night, they're going to get to around about two o'clock, try to restore the three o'clock transaction log and it's going to fail. And they're not going to understand why. So very important if you do take ad hoc backups that you use the copy only um, option. OK, SQL backup storage. This is quite easy. Compress all your backups. Um, if you've got a database which is, uh, I'll give you a random number, 20 gigs, that's going to compress probably down to in the ballpark of three gigs. So if you've got, if you're backing up to disk or an external storage device, you can get a huge number of backups um, on a on a that that storage device because it compresses so well. The caveat to that is any database that contains large image files, image files don't compress. So if it's just straight up data, and this obviously isn't just GP, but if it's straight up data, the compression ratio is fantastic. So you can keep a large amount of backups, again, that should easily meet your business requirements. Um, I have a little script there that tells you how to figure out what your compression ratio is at this time. Um, I see, you know, I, I made a note right there, put these backups on their own drive storage for the reasons I mentioned. You can take that drive, a virtual drive, or in some cases a physical drive and move it wherever you want and attach it to something and bring it back on and give you a quick ability to do a restore. Um, backups, after you've determined how many you need, set up a job to delete old backups so you don't run out of storage. Um, I, again, I mentioned that I see that entirely too often where I, I connect into a server and I look at the backup drive, and I see that red bar and I go look at the the, the uh, event logs and I see that the backups have no longer run because of this lack of space. So transaction logs I mentioned, um, again, depending on the how much recovery uh, or how, how much data loss you can sustain or what your recovery time is, it's going to dictate how frequently you should back up these transaction logs. I see some places where those transaction logs are not backed up. I think that's bad practice. Um, back up those transaction logs frequently throughout the day. Um, the more frequently you have them backed up, the less data you're going to lose, and the quicker we can get you back up and running. Okay. These last two notes here don't allow updates to, well, basically any application. Uh, updates to operating systems are generally fine, but don't allow uh, Windows updates to arbitrarily update specifically SQL Server, the same folds true for Microsoft Exchange or Microsoft CRM, uh, Microsoft SharePoint. Don't allow it to happen. Um, a lot of times there are post update things that have to be addressed that during the installation they are not addressed. This can also be an issue whereby, and I saw this, this a while ago, but I saw it with Service Pack 2, um, they release an update, it causes issues, and then they pull it back. That's why you don't want your system just arbitrarily updating. It should be in a controlled manner, preferably in a test dev and then into production. Uh, SQL indexes, that's all about performance. Um, one of the things I see is people use maintenance plans to, you know, uh, rebuild indexes. It's it's a it's an option that you can create a task. It's, it's not a good option. Um, it doesn't really take into account all of the things that you should take into account when building indexes um, for your database. Uh, and it will actually cause your database to grow huge. The, the login grows ma massive um, because of the way that functionality is, is working. If you have internal or external IT, um, I kind of suggest uh, Ola. It's uh, the, this is a gentleman that has stuff online, literally tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people use his solutions um, to better provision, index, maintenance, and monitoring of the SQL Server to give you better performance. Okay, 
I already mentioned this, but I want to mention it again. Um, storage. Make sure you have adequate storage for your backups and for your data. That red bar is actually one that I did, in fact, take from a client. It's a real, real event. Um, just make sure that you've you've got that backup strategy in plan. You know what you need, and therefore, you know, space is allocated. Um, since I'm showing this little red bar, one of the other things too is this client did not have 1.5 terabytes of backups. Um, try to have your servers and your infrastructure set up purpose built. So if this is for backups, we want to try and avoid stockpiling other things on it um, because that makes it more difficult to control what is actually on it and calculate the space needed. We can easily calculate space needed for backups based on how many databases we have, compression ratios, and so on and so forth. But if somebody has uploaded all of their, I don't know, iTunes music to the server, that that's a problem. So we just want to make sure that we're purpose building these. Okay. Monitoring. Um, you yourself could have SQL Management Studio on your machine if your if your IT allow you to do that. If not, then you, your IT division should be looking at the activity monitor. As you see, it's uh, the first one's activity monitor. It's in SQL Management Studio. To the right side, it shows the jobs. It shows when they run or when they ran, when they're running. Uh, it shows their status. It shows you if they're enabled. Um, to the right of that, it'll actually tell you how long the job ran for. Uh, good, good information there. And then you can highlight it and then look at further information as to why the jobs, you know, failed. You know, normally is what you're looking at um, and see what's going on. That's inside the SQL Management Studio. Very important. Um, you can also go down to the SQL agent and jobs like I show in the middle tier there and right click a specific job and click view history. And the in view history, it'll actually show you every step in the job, actually what happened as uh, and also detailed notes below. Um, again, this is something that should be being done. And in a second, I'm going to mention, I'm going to show you notifications, which is what should also be in play to send information about this to your IT or to specific persons. Um, and then this is the last one is the maintenance plan. Like I told you in the, the beginning, um, when you're creating a backup plan uh, it, within SQL, it's, 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 it's WYSIWYG, what you see is what you get. So it simply is inside the SQL Management Studio, drag and drop your steps, link them together and give it a schedule. It's as simple as that. Um, the only thing you have to do is know where you're going to put those backups and make sure that they are being cleaned out. I'd like to point out, you don't have to do your backups on the SQL Server. Uh, again, having it somewhere else is best practice. Having it on a completely different drive system is ultimately your best practice because you know if you're putting it all on the same RAID and that RAID goes, your, your backups went with it. Um, so you can actually back up to a network path uh, on a different server, on a different RAID, uh, and that server could be on a different VM host with different virtual disks, uh, and you'd be just fine. But again, best practice is not just to stick it on the same RAID, same server, just in case. Database mail operators, alerts, and notifications. I would say that, not even exaggerating, 20% of people bother to set this up. Um, inside of SQL, there's plenty of, I mean, there's literally thousands of combinations of alerts that you can set up to let you know about database sizes, uh, queue lengths of uh, and, and IO issues, um, memory issues, all kinds of stuff on the server, fatal errors, uh, read issues, page problems. You can create up alerts for all of those. And when you've, uh, with, with configuring an alert, you can configure your database mail, which is a, a part of a SQL. And as you see there, I have this one, the one the example I have here is actually using Office 365. So it's out in never, never land out in the cloud. You can um, configure database mail, configure an alert, and then configure an operator. Um, I suggest groups rather than individuals um, in case David Smith takes a long-term vacation. Um, have the alert configured to, the, to an operator, and then specify what the notification um, is. And, and, and indeed, if you look into this, you can set up certain actions as well. Uh, if it's, uh, you know, if, if it's an issue with the temp DB database getting too big or a transaction log being too large, you could potentially set up um, uh, events to reduce the size of that or, or, or proactively take care of the situation. I generally don't like to do that. I like to really know what's happening so the system doesn't just make arbitrary decisions based on a hard-coded 
um, action. And again, I have uh, on the right side, you see it says when the job succeeds, when the job fails, when the job completes. A any task that is paramount to the sanctity of your data, you want to know if it happened. And this is whether you're using an external backup system or a, 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 the SQL itself. Set that to completes. Don't set it to fail. If you set it to fail and the messenger can't deliver the message, you're, you're just going to make the assumption that it, in fact, succeeded. So that's pretty much all I have. It was a lot. Um, I know I seem to be trying to drive it home, but it, we, 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 you know, it's, it, your environment has to have a solid documentation and an absolute recovery plan. And with that, I'm going to give it back to Tom, unless anyone has questions. If anybody has any questions for Ian, if they could put it in the chat window, we can answer them for for you then. I believe I and actually I know you'll be getting copies of this slide, so all of my notes above. You will you'll have them all. Well, nice job, Ian. Yeah. Great information, yeah. Ian. Great information. Uh, let's take just another minute or two to see if anybody types anything into the chat. Clearly, I was really thorough. You were very thorough. Yes, you were. <laughs> All right, I don't think we have any questions. So thanks again, Ian. Great information. Great job, Ian. Thank you. And, and again, just let me say again, I know that most people on here are not IT, but please take into consideration what I said and um, you know, speak to IT, make sure you understand what they have for you. All right. Sorry, right, so we're gonna take about a 25 minute break and uh, wrap it up with the last session of the day. With Diane Bishop, we're gonna talk all about GP workflows and then that will be the end of this, uh, this June user group meeting. So see you back here in 25 minutes, everyone, thanks.